So we're discussing what happens when you die. We've looking at, we are looking at this topic from various directions. And there's no use in me just saying, well, or quoting, well, this text says this, and this text says that, and that text said that. Why? Because most of the world doesn't believe that the Bible is accurate. So what I've decided to do in this lecture is to start off by looking at who's the God of the living and who's the God of the dead, which we've done. We found Jesus is the God of the living and we found that Osiris or Baphomet or Satan is the God of the dead. Not only that, we found that the God of the dead believes in this immortal soul where Osiris would be the judge of life after death. And the various marketing plans that Satan has come up with is, is uh, you either go to heaven or you go to hell or, or uh, purgatory or you go to a place of waiting or not only that, you can come back and be reincarnated. This amongst others are some of the marketing plans that he's developed. So we also went and found out what do demon worshippers have, I, I, what information do they have? The satanic high priests, the people that are in communication with Satan himself, what do they know? Well, the answers that came from that is satanic high priests say that there is no life after death. In, fact, in actual fact, what happens is that not only is there not life after death, but over millennia, and hundreds, and hundreds of years, they've been trying to convince mankind that we have an immortal soul. And they are using our senses to get this right. They are uh, creating certain events and certain happenings to make people believe that they are speaking in seances or in experiences. Their senses are telling them that something's there. They hear the voice or they see something of something that they recognize. They get information that they recognize, meaning that this being has got a more superior knowledge than what we currently have on earth. So dying and your soul continuing on, it lives in a more a superior environment or some higher existence than what we have today on earth. This is pretty much what the general population believes. This is what Satan says. He teaches, and this way he is deceiving mankind. The Bible warns us to not get involved in divination or any Harry Potter stuff like enchanters or, or wizards, etc. And over and above that it says don't get involved in necromancy because anything in the belief with life after death is opening up the door for Satan to impersonate. So what does the Bible actually teach about life after death? We know what the one side says. So what does the other side say? What does the Bible teach? We read one or two texts, but let's have a look at a few more. Psalms 146 verse 4 says the following. His breath goeth forth and he returneth to his earth. In that very day his thoughts perish. Do you remember what we were discussing in the beginning? I said, is there life after death? And if so, do the souls who have life after death, are they cognitive? Do they have a cognitive ability? Psalms explains that after death, the very thoughts perish. Read it again. In uh, Psalm 146 verse 4, His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth. In that very day, his thoughts perish. Let's see what Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10 says. For there is no work nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave where thou goest. According to Ecclesiastes, there's no cognitive ability, no device, no knowledge, no work, nothing, nothing in the grave. Let's try another one. Remember, to understand a theme in the Bible, you have to take the entire Bible and make sure that in its entirety, it does not contradict itself. What does Corinthians tell us? 1 Corinthians 15 verse 29 states, else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? This is a text which I've put in front of uh, people who believe in life after death, specifically in the New Apostolic Church. There's an understanding where you can baptize the dead. You can seal the dead. They have services where they uh, have services devoted worldwide to the dead. And in this process, they accept that it's their responsibility to transfer the Holy Spirit to the dead. 
And they baptize the dead. But the, there is no knowledge, no device, no work in the grave. There's nothing there. 1 Corinthians tells us in verse 29 of chapter 15, why are they then baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? If they cannot come to the sermon or to the, the meeting and the service to receive your baptism, why are you baptizing them? The Bible explains that you have life and you have death. And at the end of life, boom, it stops. That graphic explains that at that red dot, nothing continues. These are just a couple of the text words. Let's have a look what it says in Ecclesiastes 9 verses 5 to 6. For the, living, for the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. This is very clear. This says, uh, that not only do the dead know nothing, but the living know that they shall die. And in total contrast, the dead know nothing. Neither do they have any more reward. So they can't receive the reward of baptism or they cannot receive the emotional reward of their child or their daughter or some loved one doing something in, in, on the earth. They cannot receive the enjoyment of that because the grave doesn't praise. Also, when you die, your love, your hatred, your envy, everything is now perished. In other words, there is, according to this text, no biblical substantiation to life after death. There's no cognitive thinking. There's no essence of anything that is alive. Let's check Psalm 6 verse 5. For in death there is no remembrance in thee. In the grave, who shall give thee thanks? Who's going to thank thee? Nobody. Not in the grave. Let's check Psalm 88 verses 10 to 12. Wilt thou show wonders to the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise thee? Shall thy loving kindness be declared in the grave? Or thy faithfulness in destruction? Shall thy world wonders be known in the dark? And thy righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? You see, these are rhetorical questions that are being given out by the psalmist. Are you going to show wonders to the dead? I mean, you know that they're not alive. Are you going to show wonders? Uh, shall the dead arise and praise thee? Or, or shall the loving kindness be declared in the grave? Or thy faithfulness in destruction? Shall thy wonders be known in the dark? These are all rhetorical questions. Obviously not. I've told you over and over and over again, he says. The dead know nothing. Psalms 115 verse 17 says, The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. Job 7 verses 9 to 10, As the cloud is consumed away and vanisheth away, so he that goeth down into the grave shall come up no more. He shall return no more to his house, neither shall his place know him any more. So the place where the fox sisters heard these rappings, According to the word of God, it says he doesn't return to his house. He doesn't come up from the grave anymore. So the fox sisters hearing this and not obviously recognizing that Job 7, 9 to 10 says that the spirit cannot rise up anymore. They got tricked into believing something that satanic high priests are laughing at. They said <laughs> they've fallen for it. There's absolutely no cognitive ability in life after death. Well, that's what the Bible says. It's confirming what the satanic high priest says. No matter what one's senses might have perceived or experienced, this is the truth. And this shows the true character of God. The dead know not anything, according to Ecclesiastes 9 verse 5. The dead praise not the Lord, according to Psalm 115, Isaiah 38. The dead do not remember anything according to Psalm 6 verse 5. And their very thoughts perish. The memory that they have passes away according to Psalms 146. So you have life and you have death. We have two states and you have life that ends boom, at death. What happens after that? God's truth and Satan's lies are always as far as, as in the Old Testament. You either face west, the Shekinah glory, or you turn your back and you face east. It's not that you either go to heaven or you go to hell. No, no, there's a new theory. You don't go there, you go to a place of waiting. No, God's truth is as far as from the east is from the west when it comes to Satan's lies. 
God says there's nothing that happens after death. By the satanic word says, no, 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 there's lots of stuff that happens after death. Let's ask the Roman Catholic system. What do you believe? Well, here's a, an image or a quote from the Office for the Catechism of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. Article 1, number 366 states, The church teaches that every spiritual soul is immortal. It does not perish when it separates from the body at death. The Catholic encyclopedia known as New Advent explains that immortality is the human soul that will survive death, continuing in the possession of an endless conscious existence. It implies that the being which survives shall preserve its personal identity and be connected by conscious memory with the previous life. Is that biblical or do the dead not know anything? The memory of them is forgotten. We've just read that in the Bible. So where does the Catholic Church get this idea that the personal identity will be maintained and connected by cognitive thinking, by conscious memory with the previous life? This image comes from ancient times and it depicts how people believed that you would pass through to the other side, life after death. Servants of Pharaohs were buried along with the Pharaoh whether you were uh, young or old, doesn't matter. If your boss died, you would be buried alive with him. Because death is just a portal to go through to the other side. This is the belief in Osiris. This is the opportunity for you to go to a higher state of existence. This is satanic teaching. Unfortunately, throughout history, this is what has been maintained and this is what has been believed. And even today, this is what's being propagated on all the media channels around the world. I use the New Apostolic Church as an example again because I know it, I understand it, I grew up with it and I was part of it until I left. They say in, in their documentation that the New Apostolic Church believes in the immortality of the soul. They say that the, the idea of life after this is substantiated by the, what they call departed services, services for the departed where you can pray for, you can baptize, seal, etc., the dead. 1 Timothy 6 explains something different though. It says that the King of kings and Lord of lords who only hath immortality to whom be honor and power everlasting. Who has got immortality only according to the Bible? The King of kings and Lord of lords. At present he's the only one who has got immortality. But yet there's this idea that is so well known about life after death. What does the Bible teach about the soul? Okay, so if the soul also dies at death, I don't quite understand this. What, is this. what happens to the soul, this part of mankind that supposedly was supposed to go somewhere and now you're telling me it doesn't? Well, the King James Version Bible uses the word soul 1,600 times. And it never uses the term immortal soul. Not once. Only God is immortal. But interestingly enough, the Bible declares uh, death to be a type of sleep. It declares that at least 53 times in the Bible. It says in Job 7 verse 21, Now I shall sleep in the dust. Mark 5 39, The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. For David fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers. Acts 13, 36. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 17. But I would not have you be ignorant concerning them which are asleep. Now what does it mean to be asleep? How cognitive are you when you are asleep? Well, if you sleep like I do, you don't know much until the next morning. What does it mean to be asleep? Why does the Bible use this term asleep? Because asleep refers to a person that's actually alive, but yet has not cognitive, got cognitive ability. Well, let's have a look what happened in Genesis 2. Genesis 2 verse 7 explains how God created man. We are taught today that man is mind, body, and soul. Three separate entities. In the New Age, they even say mind, body, soul, and emotions. Four separate entities. Well, let's find out what the Bible says. It says in Genesis 2 verse 7, 
And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So there you have the three entities, uh, body, mind, and soul, or dust, breath, and soul. Well, read carefully. What does it say? It says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath. Those are the two elements, dust or minerals from the earth, and the breath of life which comes from God. What does it say after that? And man received a living soul. No, check again. What does it say? Man became a living soul. You see, by connecting those two elements, the dust of the ground with the breath of God, you have a third element that exists when those two are connected together. By putting those two together, God allows man to become a living soul. And yet the New Apostolic Church's statement on the evolution theory says the following. It is therefore conceivable that modern mankind, Homo sapiens, was endowed with a soul. You see the problem? Man doesn't have a soul. Man, according to the Bible, is a soul. You have to have the one and the other. You plug them together and boom, you have a third element. How, how can I explain this better? Let's try this example. Consider this. What two elements are needed to make a light work? Well, number one, you need an electrical bulb, a light bulb. And number two, you need electricity. There's a whole bunch of stuff in between. But let's take those two as an example. You need two critical elements. You need a light bulb and you need electricity. Those are the two most important, right? Now, what happens if you turn off the light? So, for example, you disconnect the electricity. What is the light? It's switched off, right? The, the bulb. Now, it's basically, if you would like, asleep. Because if I plug in the plug into the wall, what happens to the light bulb? Bing! It's now awake. But if you notice, we had two elements. We had electricity and we had a light bulb. And when you plug them together, when you let the electricity arrive at the light bulb, what do I have? I've got electricity, I've got the light bulb, and I have light. There's a third element now present in this formula which wasn't there beforehand. When I connect the light bulb together with the electricity, boom, I got light. What happens when I do the reverse? If I unplug the light bulb, what happens? Well, that light bulb goes back to sleep. Where's the light gone? Has it now gone and sat on the table and when you plug it back in, it jumps back inside the light bulb? No. When you unplug the electricity, the light bulb goes back to sleep. When you plug it back in, boom, the light comes back al alive again. See, this is what the Lord is explaining. He took the dust of the earth and the breath of life and he plugged them together and boom, there was a third element that was in existence when the two are connected. That's called the soul. Now what happens to this third element? the point of death. At the time of death, what happens to this, this so-called immortal soul or this idea of this third element? Where does it go? Well, it doesn't go anywhere. You see, just like when you unplug the light and the, or unplug the electricity and the light bulb goes to sleep, if you were to unplug the breath of life, the soul would go to sleep. If you were to unplug the physical body, the soul would go to sleep. Now, is this possible? Does the Bible actually confirm what I'm saying? Well, let's check. Everything has to be biblical. We cannot go on some escapade of what I say or what you say. Let's check what the Bible says. Genesis 35 gives us an example of Rachel, who was, who was at the point of death. It says in verse 18, And it came to pass as her, in other words, Rachel's soul was departing, for she died. Here her soul was leaving her body, right? This is the way it's understood. Well, the original word for soul, you have to go back and you have to be very careful here because we need to understand that diligent study is needed. Throughout history, diligent study has been an order of the day. But today, with instant food and instant coffee and instant this and auto banks and everything's instant, we want instant theology and click the fingers and boom, I must be in heaven. You see, the time has to be taken to study this thing. So let's have a look. What is the original word that was used? 
in Hebrews, when they wrote this word, her soul was departing. Well, according to Strong's Concordance, which is possibly the, the most uh, reliable one in the world, the one that most scholars use, it's the foundation for biblical scholarship, it says that the word, the original word used here was nefesh. Nefesh is an interesting word and it comes from the word nefash, which is H5314 if you're looking for it, in the Strong's, and this is a primitive word that means what? To breathe. So if you go to the original translation and you understand what is written, it says, and her, it had come to pass that her soul was leaving her. Her nefesh was leaving her. In other words, her breath was leaving her. What does Ecclesiastes 12, 7 say? Because this is one of them that is sub used as to substantiate the belief that when you die, you go to heaven. And then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7. Here your spirit goes back to God who gave it to you in the first place. Be careful. Let's go and check. What does the original word in Hebrew say? This original word is the word ruach. And what this means in direct transla translation is the wind by resemblance breath or a sensible or, a, or violent exhalation. So what does this say? Let's just check again. Let's put that, that word ruach, breath, exhalation in, into context. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the ruach, the breath, shall return to God who gave it. This is a perfect example of plugging in the light and disconnecting the light. God took the, the dust of the earth in Genesis, and he breathed in the ruach, the breath of life, the nefesh, and man became a living soul. At this point, the dust returns to earth and the ruach, the nefesh, the spirit, returns to God who gave it. Just because today's word is used as soul or spirit doesn't necessarily mean it's an immortal element of mankind that continues after death. This is why we have to be very, very careful on how we understand the Bible. No longer can we just read through the Bible accepting that that word means the following. Imagine you were born in the 1940s and I told you that I was a very gay person or I was queer. Now those words at that time would have meant I was a very excitable person, I was a very joyful person, but I was a bit strange, I was a bit weird. Today if I was to say that people would think I was a homosexual and as queer, that's still quite weird but also has to refer to homosexuality. Just in the same way how words have changed over time to mean something else, spirit or ruach in the olden days cannot mean an, an immortal part of man today. It's got to mean ruach in the Old Testament. It's got to mean ruach in the New Testament. Let's give another example. 1 Kings 17 verses 21 to 22. The prophet Elijah had come to a boy that had died and he stretches out over this boy and he says, O Lord God, I pray thee, let, let this, soul, this child's soul come into him again. Just as in the example with Rachel, the word used for soul here in the original Hebrew is nefesh, uh, the child's breath. He's asking, Lord, you've taken the breath back to you, the ruach, you've taken it back. Please let it come back into the child's body. Let him be a living soul again. What about the word ghost in the, in the, in the modern translations? Well, Genesis uh, 25 verse 8 explains that Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. Where was Abraham gathered? Up to his people in heaven or in this place of waiting? No, his people were in the grave. And he gave up the ghost. Let's check another one. Genesis 25 verse 17. Ishmael gave up the ghost and died. Genesis 35 verse 29. Isaac gave up the ghost and died. And he was also gathered unto his people. So what does this mean to give up the ghost? Well, all of these references refer to or texts refer to the word ghost. And it actually comes from the word gava. 
Now, in Strong's Concordance, it explains what the word gava is. This is a primitive root word to mean to breathe out or expire, to be dead, to give up the ghost or to perish. Is there any indication there of some third part of immortality going somewhere? No. All it means is that there's a, a, a gava. He gave up the breath. He gave up the ghost and he died and was collected with his parents or with his family. He was gathered unto his people. There's this element of ruach appearing again. What about Jesus? He's our example. He supposedly went and preached to the souls at the time of Noah on that Sabbath day that he was asleep. Well, uh, Mark, at least in chapter 15, verse 37 says, Jesus cried with a loud voice and he gave up the ghost. Well, the ghost in the New Testament is written in Greek. That word ghost comes from the word, the word ekpneo. It means to expire or give up the ghost. So which part of Jesus then went into the realms of the departed, into the people that were there from the time of Noah? It didn't. According to the word, he expired. He gave up the ghost. John 19 verse 30 says, And when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head, and he gave up the ghost. Ah, but you see, here's another reference to ghost. This is where Jesus really gave up his immortal spirit. No, not, real, not necessarily. Let's check what the Greek says. In Greek, the word here is pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A. This is a similar word to pneumonia, the a, a sickness that you'd get on the lungs or a pneumatic drill <laughs> that they chop up roads with using air, compressed air. Well, pneuma is exactly that. It's a current of air, a breath, a blast or a breeze. So when Jesus is hanging on the cross and he had the vinegar, he says, it is done. And he goes, it is done. And he gives up the ghost. The pneuma, the gava, the ruach, all meaning the same thing. That's why Psalms 104 verse 29 says, Thou hidest thy face, and they are troubled. Thou takest away their breath, and they die, and return to their dust. There you go. You just separate the two elements. The Lord takes the breath, and dust to dust. Job 27 verse 3 explains, All the while my breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. This is the way the Bible writes it this way and then writes it that way to make sure that we understand all the while the breath of God is in me, the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. This is the same thing. The breath of God, the Spirit is one and the same thing. So what about animals? What happens when we die? Well, you go to the grave and there's no cognitive thinking after death. But what about our animals? Pooch or Brutus in the garden? What happens to our cats and our hamsters and the birds and the cows and all these things? What happens to Bambi when she gets shot? Well, according to Ecclesiastes 3 verses 19 to 20, it says, For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth beasts, as the one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they all have one breath, all go unto one place, all are of the dust, and all, shall all turn to dust again. Is there any difference between animals and mankind when we die? No. We all have the same breath. God gave us our breath and he takes it back. And we all return to dust and that's where we will all be. That's where all our forefathers are. And according to Psalms and so many others, the dead know not anything. See, but this is the problem here. This is stemming again from not identifying the Antichrist. Remember the Antichrist beast is a beast that speaks out of both corners of his mouth. He speaks this way, but he also speaks that way. I showed you the, the uh, examples from the Catholic Encyclopedia, New Advent, that says the immortality of the soul is the part that survives death and continues on even having reference to the, the, the person that it was prior to death. Well, have a look at this and you'll see exactly a perfect example of how this beast speaks out of both corners of its mouth. New Catholic Encyclopedia, article Soul, Human Immortality of, in the Bible. It says, Nepes, or Nefesh, comes from an original root to breathe, and thence breath of life. 
Since breath distinguishes the living from the dead, nepes is used in regard to both animals and humans. After death, the nepes goes to sheol or rest, the Hebrew word for the grave. The above summary indicates, now listen to what they say, that there is no dichotomy of body and soul in the Old Testament. The notion of the soul surviving death is not readily discernible in the Bible. Wow! Can you imagine producing a marketing plan where you teach people that they have an immortal soul and that you have to pay to get your family members taken from purgatory to heaven? But yet the secret encyclopedia that you keep hidden back in your secret Vatican archives says that there's no dichotomy after death, there's no split up because nepes or nefesh is the root word to breathe and when you die you're dead. Well that's the Old Testament they say. Well let's check what they say about the New Testament. The same encyclopedia explains the soul of the Old Testament means not a part of man but the whole man as a living being. That's what we've proven from Genesis. Similarly, in the New Testament, it signifies human life, the life of an individual conscious object. Recent exegetes have maintained that the New Testament does not teach the immortality of the soul in the Hellenistic sense of survival of an immortal principle after death. This is a beast that puts one marketing plan out there to teach to the goyim, the catechumen, the cattle. This is the fulfillment of the Roman Catholic teachings, but insider Johannism. The secret teachings inside says, this is a big lie. There's nobody that goes, nothing that survives immortally after death. The people that believe that are falling into the same trap that the satanic high priest said they would. What happens? We've got life and we've got death. And your life stops, boom, at the point of death. At this point in time, the Lord disconnects your electrical supply from the wall plug. In other words, your dust and your breath get separated. The two elements that make us a living soul are then separated. The Bible calls this separation a sleep of death. Psalms 13 verse 3 explains, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Acts 7 verse 59 to 60 says the same. It explains, And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. In that sense, they use the word pneuma, breath, the, the pneumatic drill, the air, the wind, the expulsion of that from the body. Here he says, receive my pneuma. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not the sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. In accordance to the word of God, Stephen fell asleep when he was stoned. That's why Jesus went and spoke to his people and he said in John 11, 11, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may wake him out of his sleep. And they said to him, But if he's sleeping, let him sleep, man. He's probably tired. Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. How be it? Jesus spoke of his death. But they thought he had spoken of taking a rest in sleep. And then in John 11, verse 12 to 14, it explains, uh, Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. So for Jesus, it doesn't matter if you're asleep or dead. But how does that work? Because if you're asleep, you're actually still alive. Well, John 11.39 from the International Version speaks and says, But Lord, by this time there is a bad odor because he's been there for four days. You see, this is where they, they say, but he's... He's not sleeping, he's dead. But he's been dead for how long? Four days. So not only is he dead, his body is falling apart. He's rotting away. What did Jesus do? Well, we'll see now. You see, we know that there's life and we know that there's death. And at the point of separation, which we call death, when we die, these two elements are pulled apart. And after that, as this dotted line explains, we sleep the sleep of death. But Jesus, who has control over us, can wake us up at any point along that path. Anywhere along that dotted line, he can wake us up. At the point that he decides, he says, Lazarus, come forth. And he plugs the light bulb into the wall socket again. And there you have three elements 
the body, the breath, and the living soul. And it's also interesting to realize how Lazarus came up to the top and Jesus said, release him. He's still bound in his robes. So somebody had to have carried him from the back of the tomb when he was lying down to the top. We'll check who that is in a moment. So think about this for a moment. For Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter if you are alive like we are now or if you are dead. For him, it matters if you have gone into the grave under his power. You see, when you die in Christ, you are asleep. Because just like I can walk into my daughter's room and shake her awake and say, wake up, wake up. Jesus can come back to earth and he can say, wake up, wake up. All the people that have died in Christ. The problem is if you have died not in Christ. Then you are dead even to Jesus. Through the spoken word, the Lord said, let there be light. He also said, let man, become, let man come forth. He, through the power of his word, was able to create things. From minerals, he created animals. From minerals, he created man. From falling apart, de uh, decomposing minerals of the earth, he recreated Lazarus through the power of his word, showing that he is the creator of creation. And at that point in time, he was able to have his authority restored as being the God of the living. Jesus can wake any of our uh, people that have gone before us. He can wake them up at any time that he wishes. doesn't matter if we've been cremated or if we've been tossed to sea. The Bible says the sea will even give up the bodies of those that have died. So it doesn't matter if we've somehow been eaten by a shark. It's got nothing to do with the physical composition of who we are. It's got to do with God being able to take us and say, Lazarus, come forth. John eleven forty three to 44 says, And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth. You see, if we are asleep in Christ, we're actually alive in his eyes. For him, it doesn't make a difference as long as we've died in Christ. So we mustn't look at death from man's perspective that we are dead. We have to look at death from God's perspective. Are we asleep in Christ? In other words, he's going to wake us up when he wants to. Or are we dead in Christ? John 11 verse 21 explains the further, the further conundrum about, well, when is this all going to take place? See, Martha came to John and said, Lord, but if you hadn't been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Verse 21 of John 11. He wouldn't have died. You could have kept him awake. You would have kept him alive by healing his illness. And then Jesus replies and says in verse 23, thy brother shall rise again. He's going to rise again. And she obviously has not experienced yet the power of Jesus saying, Lazarus, come forth. So she's thinking, yeah, my brother will rise again. Oh, of course, I know when he will rise again. Verse 24, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. See, this is why the depiction of the resurrection is Christ with his clouds and clouds referring to angels in the New Testament. He's going to come with his clouds and heaven will be empty for a period of time. Jesus is coming with the angels, just like the angels had carried Lazarus still bound in his, in his death robes up to the top of the tomb. So the angels come down and wake God's people up out of the graves. Martha knew that this was stock standard theology for her. This was what she'd always known. I know that he'll rise again, but I, that'll be on the resurrection day. I still want him around now. And then Jesus said, well, Lazarus come forth and boom, there it was. Job 14 verse 12 explains, So man lieth down and riseth not till the heavens be no more. When you die, you lie down. In other words, you go to the grave. You are gathered unto your people. This will happen until the heavens be no more. Do you remember the seven churches, the seven seals and the seven trumpets? What was the opening of the seventh seal? When the heavens were rolled up like a scroll? This is the point where the heavens are no more. This is the return of Jesus Christ. This is the moment that the rock hits the statue and Daniel on its feet. 
and the man lieth down and won't rise anymore. There's no cognitive thinking, nothing and death until the day that the heavens are rolled up like a scroll. So we know that there's life, we know that there's death, and life ends at the point of death. At that point in time, we sleep until Jesus says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work. On that judgment day when the Lord arrives, he says, Lazarus, come forth. He says, Mary, come forth. Michael, John, Paul, whoever you have fallen asleep in Christ, come forth and be with me. As it explains in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ, those that are asleep, shall rise first. Here you have the separation of the two elements at death, and they stay separated, and God has got the breath with him until he decides to bring it back and plug it in. At that point in time, he says, come forth, and the angels help the people out of the ground, exactly in line with 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 6. John 5 is another example in verse 28 and 29. He says, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. And shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. And on that judgment day, when Jesus issues according to the rewards, according to our works and according to our deeds, we will either rise in Christ or we won't. We either rise in the resurrection done good and, and the resurrection to life or we'll have done evil and we'll have the resurrection of damnation. That is when the Lord plugs the soul back together and boom, that third element exists. Okay, well it's pretty clear what the Bible says. It's confirming that what Satan said was true. But are there any biblical texts that contradict this, that say, well, there is life after death? Because where are all these churches getting this idea of immortality from? One of the most important or profound examples of this is the Mount of Transfiguration. This is explained in Mark 9 verses 2 to 10. And after six days Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John and leadeth them up into a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his raiment became shining exceeding white as snow so as no fuller on earth can wipe them. And there appeared unto them Elijah and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And there was a, and there was a cloud that overshadowed them. And a voice came out of a cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. And suddenly when they looked around about, they saw no man anymore save, save Jesus, only with themselves. In Mark 9 verses 2 to 10, this is explained a little bit further. As they came down from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what they had seen, till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. And they kept that saying with themselves, questioning one with another what the rising from the dead would mean. Okay, so here on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus appears in a transfigured new body, and at that point in time, Elijah and Moses appear with him. And the people that are with him want to build three altars, because they recognize here's Elijah's come from the dead, and Moses has come from the dead, so these people are obviously somehow in heaven, or they've continued immortality with their immortality after death. They've come up from the grave and they are now standing with Jesus. How does this whole thing work? Where does it influence our thinking on life after death? And why were they questioning, what does it mean to rise after death? Remember Jesus said to them, keep this to yourselves. And they were questioning one with another what rising from the dead would mean. They didn't understand this concept that Jesus would rise from the dead on the third day. Who were these dead people, Elijah and Moses? How did they get there? There's proof. Life after death is true. Well, be careful here. 2 Kings 2.11 explains it quite clearly. This is now regarding Elijah. What happened when Elijah died? Let's read it. It says, And there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up 
by a whirlwind into heaven. Did Elijah die? No. According to the Bible, he was taken up to heaven. So he never saw death. What about Moses? Did Moses die? Yes, he did. So how did he get there? Well, read with me Jude 1 verse 9. It says the following. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Michael the archangel, do you remember we discussed this? Michael, he who is what God is. Who's the only person in the universe that can dispute against the devil for ownership of your body? It's only the creator that can do that. He put it together in the first place. So now, for some reason, he's wanting to put Moses back together again. He's got the one element, the spirit that's gone back, the ruach, the nefesh that's gone back to God who gave it. He's got the one bit. All he needs now is the other bit. And there, as he walks to Moses' grave, they're standing probably with his foot on Moses' body and saying, Bum, this guy belongs to me. And Michael, he who is what God is, contended with Satan for ownership of the body of Moses. So the Lord put Moses back together. It's explained in Jude 1, 1 verse 9. The body of Moses with the breath of God and boom. Later on at the Mount of Transfiguration, here Elijah who didn't see death is seen and here Moses who did see death is also seen. You see, Elijah, this is the Lord explaining what's going to take place at the judgment. This is the day when Jesus comes to fetch his own, to wake those up that are asleep in Christ. He's, this explanation of these two men shows one being the, the people or depicting, like Elijah is an example. He depicts those that will be alive when Jesus comes. He depicts the people that will be taken up from the earth who won't see death. If the Lord were to come today and he was merciful on me, I would be able to rely on Elijah's experience at the Mount of Transfiguration and say, oh, that's how the Lord's going to do it. My grandma who's passed away, if the Lord is merciful to her and she somehow makes it to heaven as well, well, then Moses is a perfect example of her uh, process of getting to heaven. You see, the Lord is going to put her back together just as he put Moses back together. And where Elijah represents those that are going to be translated from life, Moses represents those that are going to be translated and raised from the dead. Hebrews 9 verses 1 to 8 explains that, For there was a tabernacle made, but into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Hebrews is in the Old Testament or in the New Testament? In the New Testament. Here, a New Testament reference to the Old Testament tabernacle saying that the Holy Spirit was working in the Old Testament through the sanctuary, but that the high priest, in order for him to get into the Holy of Holies, had to take blood with him. The Holy Spirit would obviously guide him, but he could not approach directly the throne of God because the earthly tabernacle was yet standing. This is referring to Jesus Christ as being the fulfillment in the New Testament of the tabernacle in the Old Testament. But it is clearly explaining that the Old Testament was working in, uh, the, the Holy Spirit was working in the Old Testament, in the tabernacle. The power of the Holy Spirit was available in the Old Testament. 1 Peter 4 verse 6 is another example which is often used. Read this with me. For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. A hurried reading of this verse gives the impression that the cause of the gospel was preached to them that are dead. So you can preach to the dead, you can pray for them, you can uh, baptize them, you can do, you know, the whole shebang. Well, you see, you've got to be careful again. Remember that there's a finger in the pie and it's got to do with deception. Have a look at the context in which this has been written. Have a look at the, the way that this has been written. For this cause was the gospel preached. In other words, in the Old Testament. For this, cause, for this cause in the Old Testament, the gospel was preached to them that are dead. In other words, them that are now dead in the New Testament. 
that they in the Old Testament might be judged in the same manner as today's men in the flesh. But they'll live according to God in the Spirit. So just as the example in Hebrews where the, Old Te- the, Old, the Holy Spirit was working in the Old Testament, that power has guided mankind throughout history. And the people in the Old Testament who are now dead receive the same message. The gospel was preached to them. If you don't know what I'm speaking about, please take time to watch the DVD, Who is God? That covers it in pretty much depth. So this idea of the New Testament being somehow different to the Old Testament is actually not quite correct. What about 1 Peter 3.18-20? to 20? Another one which is used to motivate this idea of life after death. Let's read it. It says, For Christ also hath suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, and being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, but which sometimes were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was appear- preparing, wherein a few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. Here there's an idea that by being put to death in the flesh, but quickened, which means made alive by the Spirit, by which he then went and preached into the prisons of the people that were uh, disobedient at the times of Noah. This is this idea that mankind is somehow immortal, but we are imprisoned after death. And through Jesus' death, he was able to go and speak to the people in that prison, even from the time of Noah onwards. Well, again, we have to just go back and look at that reference in Hebrew where, in Hebrews where the New Testament gospel is telling us that it is a fulfillment of the Old Testament sanctuary and that the Holy Spirit has worked in the Old Testament as what it's working in the New Testament. Not only that, the death of Christ has made alive the old system which they had. In other words, the tabernacle and the sanctuary is therefore fulfilled in Jesus Christ. If this text were to mean that there was life after death, it would be a text that would contradict every single other text that we've been through. Therefore, you have to do a theme study of the entire Bible to understand what happens when we die. The word prison that is used when it speaks about that Jesus preached to the spirits in prison that were there from the time of Noah. Well, that word is fulake which means a condition or physically or spiritually or at least figuratively a a cage or holding. Let's check what it says in the New Testament about prisons or being released from prison. Romans 6 verse 22 speaks about, But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and end everlasting life. You see, this is what prison is about. It's not the prison of death where you now have to receive the Holy Spirit through an apostle or where you have to somehow go back and pray for the dead. The dead know not anything, even their memory is forgotten. The prison that's spoken about in that text word is the prison of sin that we're still battling with today and through the help and support of the Holy Spirit as they did in Noah's day, we are still fighting that fight. I guess what about Lazarus? Well, Lazarus died supposedly in this parable where Jesus is explaining that Lazarus died and went to heaven. And the rich man died and went to purgatory or hell or what is called Hades. And there this man is calling to Abraham, please send the people from the dead to go and speak to my family. Well, you just have to read it there in Luke 16 verse 14 and 19 to 31. It explains there that the Pharisees who were lovers of money heard all these things. Jesus is here speaking to the Pharisees. And just as he does with us, he speaks into our life in the context of our understanding. He's speaking to the Pharisees in the context of their understanding. What did the Pharisees believe at the time? Well, firstly, they believed there was life after death. And secondly, the the uh, appearance of your life prior to death represented where you would go after death. In other words, if you were blessed and successful and wealthy and you had this tremendous achievement in life, you were blessed by God and therefore you were automatically straight to heaven. 
where Lazarus depicts the wretched, poor, uh, abominable man, if you like, who was, even the dogs licked his sores. He's the lowest of the low. And you've got this dichotomy where supposedly the rich will automatically go to heaven on death. This is what they believe. And the poor will automatically go to hell because God's not blessing them here on earth. What Jesus is doing here is he's turning this belief upside down. And he's saying, no, 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 no. It's Lazarus that goes to heaven and sits on Abraham's lap in his bosom. Oh, and it's the rich man that goes to Hades. If you had the belief in life after death and that you were wealthy and your wealth determined your going to heaven after death, and now all of a sudden that was being questioned and now it was saying that wealth determines that you're going to go to hell, it brings into question the very foundations of your belief of life after death. Jesus in his wisdom is actually removing the cornerstone of the belief in life after death by turning the Pharisee's belief upside down. The immortality of the soul is a lie that was started in Garden of Eden. And through our senses, Satan has deceived mankind for millennia and he's deceiving it today. You see, Satan always has got two doctrines, just like in the old, uh, in the description where we had the, the various religions, an insider secret religion and an outsider public religion, the same with the doctrines on death. In the, the, the public one that he markets says that the dead are conscious and cognitive, and this is the one which is available on TV and newspapers and in all the, all the churches around the world. He's got a secret hidden one, though, that says the dead know nothing and are asleep. This one he keeps hidden and he doesn't tell anybody except his satanic high priests who, thank the Lord, happened to spill the beans over to somebody that was changed in the end to Christianity. With Christ, there's only one truth. And interestingly enough, Christ's truth is the same as the satanic doctrines that are hidden. There is no life after death. The dead know nothing and are asleep. This one God shares with the whole world. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says in John 8, 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. This might come in absolute contradiction to your current beliefs. I urge you to stop the DVD. Start it again. Stop it, pause it, play it over and over and over if you have to. Pick up your Bible. Check every text word that I've given you. And make sure that what your belief is, is in line with the Word of God. Thank you for joining me in What Happens When We Die.